fits into a bad world is not good. The misfit in a bad world is good. So, um, I thought the presenter brought the, uh, the problem and the, um, the solution. Uh, but the problem is, is dark. Uh, 
England's Foreign Secretary, putting out the lights all over Europe. The light, he said, the lights all over Europe are going out and they will not be lit again in our generation, said Earl Grey. It was another one that would see. The Western nations were spiritually disintegrating in a process which has been uninterrupted ever since. I mean, these non Catholics, neither Tiesoli nor Yates was Catholic, both of them saw the state of hearts and minds in 1919, 1920, 1921, the West I was 22. And it was not good. Nevertheless, many Catholics today who wish the faith to survive are upset by the apparent weakness of the resistance of Archbishop Fox Pope Reese in particular to the obvious betrayal of his principles by their present leaders. And Catholics look for an explanation. Why are so few, relatively few, priests of the Society of Architecture re reacting against the betrayal from on high by Bishop Trey? And uh, what I would call his gang, his liberal gang. He's a spellbinder, he's a seducer, but how can decent priests let themselves be so seduced? Question. People look for an explanation. Something that the society priests do not take a public stand against the false mixing of traditional Vatican II because they're scared of being thrown out of the society with nowhere to sleep and nothing to eat. But the priests have to know that there are lay folk who would be glad to support. That can't be the real reason. It's not a question of breakfast and something to sleep. It's God the Lord. A deeper explanation might be that the priests are scared of cutting themselves out of the SSPX, which is both their human family and the framework by which they belong to the structure of the church. Don't underestimate how important the family, the priestly family, is because they don't have wives and children. Uh, therefore, well, they may have parents still, they're lucky if they do, uh, but if they have a home to go to with sisters, especially with aunts, but uh, many don't have, uh, for many, the priestly society is where they have a father, a spiritual father, a spiritual brothers, and, and sisters. Um, so that's a deeper lesson. Both their, both their human family and the framework by which they belong to the structural church. Don't underestimate that either. A priest of the, the SPX, he's, he's outside the mainstream church, or he's got no contact with the mainstream church, because his principles are so different. The Archbishop raised the SPX outside the mainstream church, not outside the church, but outside the conciliar church. So that the, all of those normal contacts that the priests used to have with the other priests of the diocese, with a deanery, with a, with a bishop, a, a diocese of bishop, and so on, all of that framework, it's, it, he hasn't got, all he's got is the society, with a superior general, with a district superior, and colleagues in society. Right? And to quit the society is to leave that behind. And it's not necessary to find any substance. So again, don't underestimate the reasons why SSPX priests can uh, not want to quit the structure of this society. But again, if these priests had a strong enough faith, they would know that providence can supply for both needs. If they had a strong enough faith, in a way, you, well, they might be accused, although many of them have a strong faith, but maybe their faith is not strong enough in particular, the faith is not strong enough to see that what Bishop Foley is doing is a problem of the faith. It's, it's not just a problem of discipline, or just a problem of the SSPX, or just a problem of... It's, it's, it's the old religion which Archbishop have maintained against the new religion. And that's two different religions, two different faiths. And the Conciliar Church is the new religion, the new faith. There's no doubt about that. And if Bishop Fully thinks 
that it will be easy for the uh, society priests to maintain their faith within the structure of the conciliar church is being naive, quite simply naive. Already, the SFP, many of the priests are putting a dagger in their trumpet. They should be trumpeting the roughness of the council, the roughness of the modern world, the necessity to go back to the true ancient, unchanging religion. That's what they should be trumpeting. And they, but they don't trumpet it because it makes them, and Bishop Fuller really discourages anybody who does trumpet it. He sacks him, he, he, he sends him down to the South Pole to evangelize the Penguins. Uh, you know, they, they, they get exiled a long way away, whatever. But he is, he is resolute, intent, and determined to change the religion of the society so that it fits in Rome. That's what he's doing. And he's not going to give up, he's not going to back down, and he's not going to stop. Humanly and shortly, a miracle, just like these four books. Bishop Tully has caught the same disease that they have, and nothing but a miracle will get him out of it. So, those are two explanations. Breakfast and bed and breakfast. Nah. Uh, family and structure. Nah. Yeah. That's more likely. Anyway, the priests are not reacting, a lot of them are not reacting. A number of them see, but they don't act on what they see. They, not enough of them see that it really is a question of faith. It's a question of new religion against the, uh, the eternal faith. On the other hand, so let's look for a third explanation. If we said that 2012 set out of the society, by Bishop Philly and his gang. In the context of the double disintegration of the two world wars, the second world war was almost deja vu. The first, coming out of the first world war, was a real shock for people. Nobody, I think, no, practically nobody foresaw the horrors of trench warfare for four years, the first world war. The, both the French and the Germans were the main um, combatants. Both thought it would be over in a matter of weeks, months at the most. The French only had maps for Germany. They intended to invade Germany, that's what they thought. That didn't exactly turn out that way. The Germans had maps of Paris and they never got near them. They never got to Paris uh, in the Second World War. Well, they, I'm sorry, they, they did, of course, later. Uh, in the First World War, they never got to Paris. You may remember that the mother of God intervened at the Marne and helped the French to block the Germans' advance to Paris. And then it settled down into trench warfare. Nobody foresaw the horrors. The constant shelling, the machine guns, it was the mud, the, the, the rats, the horrors of the trenches. The, in the context of the double disintegration of two world wars, followed by what Archbishop of Fed called the Third World War, and much worse than the other two wars, followed by a far more terrible disintegration of the Catholic Church at Vatican II. If we said that 2012 set out of the society in the context of this disintegration of modern man, is disintegrated. Modern man is no longer integrated. He's, he's pieces, different pieces flying in different directions, and often pieces of war with one another. This is what's going on inside many people today. Then we must admire the heroic feat of Archbishop of Faith in gathering together fragments from the unprecedented explosion inside the church of Vatican II. But we can hardly be surprised if the SPX should in turn, in its turn, explode from within just like the mainstream church exploded. And we shouldn't be surprised if refugees from that disintegration should have difficulty in reintegrating outside the society. The society has been, for 40 years, for many Catholics, both laity and the priests, a, a means of, of holding something together, of holding their faith together, of holding their lives together, of holding their family together, of holding their priesthood together, 
it's been a, li a, a, a lifeboat of the sinking Titanic, the mainstream church. The SSDX has been a lifeboat for many years for many Catholics. Now the lifeboat is going on. Is, is what we shouldn't be surprised if refugees from the disintegration of the mainstream church, Vatican II, should in turn have difficulty in, uh, in reintegrating it out. If, 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 the, if, they, if the lifeboat kept them out of the ocean, we shouldn't be surprised if when they jumped from the lifeboat and back into the ocean, the stormy ocean, they have difficulty in swimming. The lifeboat is being a protection, it's being almost as close as the Titanic. It's not being quite as close, it's being pretty close all the same. And now they have to jump out of the jump out of that coziness into the ocean, back into the ocean, and look for some piece of flotsam or jetsam, a piece of wood, some kind of raft, anything to grab onto to keep them from drowning. It's it's not surprising if it's not easy. Things have fallen apart. And minds and hearts have fallen apart with them. We're all of us social animals, we live in a social context. Today, uh, with the, the internet, so we all of us live in a global context. We're citizens of the globe today. And the globe has fallen apart. The globe is in the hands of the enemies of God, the Freemasons, and the Jews, and the communists, who are creations of the Jews. And the enemies of God, God has given to his enemies great power. And they are running loose them. And their things have fallen apart. Minds and hearts have fallen apart with them. I don't think, say I, that there is, I think that there is not enough integrity or integration left in minds and hearts for us to be able to think of re-beating the Archbishop's speed. We may put it together again, but it will be, it will be on a, at best on a diminished scale. It may be along the same lines as the Archbishop, but it will never achieve the global outreach that the SPX achieved. It's, the SPX was 1970, it was founded in 1970. Things have got much worse in the last 46 years since 1970. So it's a dream that anybody will be able to repeat what the Archbishop did. On a smaller scale, on a rather smaller scale, perhaps, but very different. Because hearts and minds have fallen to pieces. If you and I are lucky enough to get the true faith, that's the greatest integrator of all, the true faith which sees everything through the eyes of God, and then it's, it's a single perspective. It's the true perspective. But if anybody doesn't have the faith, it's very difficult today for them to hold themselves together. One moment you'll be saying, for instance, abortion is a horrible crime. The next moment you'll be thinking, because it doesn't really, it's not integrated, the next moment you'll be thinking, it's a woman's sacred right. It's her body, she may do what she likes with it, the, 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 there are two completely conflicting value systems. That's just one example. And the media, of course, are all the time promoting the new value system. Whereas the Catholic Church, the mainstream church, is all the time betraying, essentially putting the skids under, undermining the old value system. The old value system is natural. Nature is absolutely against the portrait. The new, the new value system has got all the power of original sin behind it. People are torn, mass of people are torn. They're not integrated. They're trying to fit together some of the old value system with some or more of the new value system. And many people, of course, don't like and can't live with what's called cognitive dissonance. Excuse that phrase. But what it, it's a phrase that is used, what it means is having a split mind, a mind divided between one thing and another. And usually in, human beings will pull the, this after that, or they'll pull that after this, but they won't usually endure 
having two value systems in them. And what's happening today is that a mass of people are sliding little by little by little from the old natural value system to the new uh, rotten, poisonous, uh, masonic value system. And the society itself is now on that slide. Vatican II was that slide from the old religion to the, the modern world, and Bishop Foley is now in a turn sliding into the modern church, the modernized church. What that means is not, uh, 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 no. it, there's not enough integrity or integration left in hearts and minds for us to be able to think of repeating the Archbishop's feet on, on the Archbishop's scale. We are nearly 50 years downhill from 1970 when the Archbishop was still able to found the SSBX. But then there were a number of Catholics, just think again of the Counter-Reformation. When Protestantism broke out, it was a complete disaster. But hanging over from the Middle Ages, there was still a lot of faith, especially in Poland, Ireland, Spain, Italy, France, that's it, the Catholic countries, the most Catholic countries. And, and therefore, the, the Church was able to pull, pull itself together in a tremendous counterattack, the Counter Reformation, which stood um, many Catholics in very good stead for many years. Down to Vatican II. The Tridentine Church, the Church of the Council of Trent, lasted, one might say, until Vatican II, and then it grew apart. So, uh, the, but when, when, the, uh, when the Catholic, when Protestantism happened, there was a lot of reaction. I uh, compare the Catholic Church to a dishcloth. It's not a very noble comparison. But when a white housewife has a dishcloth full of water, she twists once and a lot of water falls out. That was the Counter Reformation. She then unfolds the dishcloth, refolds it, twists again, and not so much water comes out, but still some water comes out. That was um, the art of the French Revolution. And there was a, quite a counter attack of uh, the church in the 19th century. Many of the parish churches here in Ireland and in France were built in the 19th century. There was considerable expansion, but it was, liberalism was eating away underneath. It was churches built, so to speak, on foundations which weren't quite solid. Partly on, on partly liberal foundations, that's not good. And so uh, there was another tre tremendous attack uh, with modernism, but it never got very far. And again, Pius X had enough same elements still in the church to be able to pull the church together and counterattack with Pashendi, uh, but it was it was more and more relying upon authority to quell the the, the poison to, 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 to uh, as an antidote to the poison. Our authority is all very well, but if the devil gets hold of the authority, then you're in dead trouble. And that was that happened to the devil got up to the top of the church. He got hold of John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth and the many cardinals and a lot of bishops, and the result was Vatican II. And there, the, the, the housewife squeezed the Archbishop of Heaven, squeezed, so to speak, squeezed, still a little water came out. But this time around, the yeah, heroic squeezing and twisting and shaking, and a few drops were out. There's only a few drops left. The, the Catholic Church is burning out, so to speak, humanly speaking. Humanly speaking, the church is in dead trouble. So, what that means is not that there is nothing to be done, but that what is to be done must be worked out more from God's point of view and less from man's point of view. At the very end of the world, God is going to allow the faith almost to disappear. That's a very interesting quotation. And very important. Luke 18, verse 8. When I come back, shall I find the faith upon the earth? Says our Lord. Meaning that at the very end of the world, I don't see how else you can interpret that quote, the church will almost have disappeared. The, the persecution of the Antichrist will have, been, will have been so terrible at the very end of the world 
that um, this is at any rate one understanding of how events the 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 persecution of the will be so terrible that the church will almost disappear. Therefore, what that means is that God can allow the church to almost disappear. He can allow it. Don't be surprised. Don't say the Catholic Church has almost disappeared, therefore God has resigned, or God has given in his had him in his resignation, or God has lost his power. Or no, 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 no. It's all part of God's supremely wise plan. If you and I get to heaven, we will see the wisdom of this plan. At the very end, God will allow the faith to almost disappear. But there will still be a few souls believing, hoping, and loving with faith and with charity. In 2016, God is giving us a foretaste of that disappearance of the church, that almost disappearance of the church at the end of the world. But souls should be able to recognize in 2016 that they still have considerable freedom to believe, to hope, and to love. And they should be able to foresee that even the most powerful of police states, the police states are closing in. Over in England, we're told that there is one camera, one public street camera for every 15 inhabitants. They're building a police state. In the United States, it is. the police, have, from having been the friends of the people, the police are now being militarized and prepared to be the tyrants of the people. Every police force in the United States is being given armored vehicles, armored weapons. They're loading up on guns and ammunition like you wouldn't believe. It's going to be, the blood is going to flow. And the tyranny is going to be imposed. Unless enough people pray. That's the one thing that still works. Politicians forget. Spelled by Americans, F-U-G-G-E-D-D-I-T. Forget it. <laughs> forget it. Arts, miserable nonsense. Modern music, or horrible ideas. Modern medicine, how to most cheaply and quickly abort. Modern law, positive nonsense, positivist nonsense. It's all, there's no such thing as the natural law any longer. It's all fabricated by men. We do what we like. We make what laws we like. We make, we men make it right and wrong. Nonsense, stupid, crazy nonsense. Everywhere, the order of God being destroyed and eliminated to be replaced by the order of man. As Pius X said at the beginning of his first encyclical, the great problem of the modern world is man putting himself in the place of God. And that's exactly it. However, there should be a, even the most powerful police states cannot stop them from practicing failure and charity. Moreover, the more heavily circumstances are made to weigh upon that freedom, the tighter and straighter grow the police states which are coming, the more glorious in heaven will be the person will be the persevering devotion of any soul to God, to his divine soul and to the blessed object. And the greater will be the merits of that soul. In other words, as events squeeze tighter, the essential thing is to turn upwards and look upwards and pray upwards so as not to be crushed within that crusher, but to be squeezed upwards towards heaven by the crusher, which of course is the way to escape the crusher. But the crusher, God is alive. Above all, the greater will be the unstoppable contribution to the welfare of the church of that soul which continues to believe, hope, and pray. All is by no means lost, and it never can be lost. God's church, the church of Almighty God, is not a merely human affair. So, that uh, is the problem, uh, the, a problem of disintegrating minds and hearts. Practically everybody around, around us. Few people are still capable of thinking. Few people want to think. Few people want reality. More and more people want the dream, the fantasy. 
Man is the last adult. What nonsense. He's never been more challenged nor sick. Man is at last emancipated, he's shaken off the shackles of God's order, and he's now free to demonstrate to Almighty God and to everybody else that he is going to do a better job of running the universe than Almighty God. Insane nonsense. But that's what's occupying the hearts and minds of today's politicians. And don't blame the politicians. How do those politicians get there? Because they're voting. They're voting for them. Who votes for them? The people. In all these quote unquote democracies, which are of course not really democracies at all, that's the, it's just an appearance. And therefore these politicians are not the people that they're puppets. They're not the people that are really just making decisions or really making things go the way they go. But they are the pretense. And they maintain the pretense of, of people governed by the people, for the people, and of the people. That's a pretense. It, today's pretense is the bad guy secret running the show. The democracy is the uh, shop window to make people think that they're governing their own lives. Re in reality, the decisions are being made in that back room, that little back room filled with smoke, with green eye shades, and so on. The, that's where the decisions are being taken. And I won't name who are the people that are really governing the back rooms because I would immediately be accused of being anti Semitic. So I don't want to name them. The answer or you know, the solution uh, there's this flyer here, copies of which are on the back table. And it says uh, on the inside, Stairway to Heaven, the five first sentences. Um, and it tells that there, there are little bits of prose uh, on the flyer with the average of the fact which tells the story which I, which I... But in 1917, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to three little children in Fatima, Portugal, to give, through them to mankind, heaven's solution for peace in this modern and war-torn, torn by war world. Half of that solution depends on the world. Concentrating Russia. But the other half depends upon Catholics, upon many Catholics, making communion of reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary on the first Saturday of five consecutive months. Well, the five consecutive months, I think, to which are attached, to which is attached, the promise of heaven, that's stupendous. Your sh Our Lady promises that the, uh, she will be, at the moment of death, she will be there with all graces necessary for, for salvation. At the moment of death, with all graces necessary for salvation. In other words, the person is still going to have to make a choice themselves. But with all graces, will will make, make, will push them, push them, they won't force them, will push them to make the right decision in favor of God, to be pleasing to God, and so to be saved for eternity instead of damned for eternity. That's a pretty big promise. And it's attached to the five first to five first sentences because that way, with luck, heaven calculates, Catholic souls will get in the habit of making the five first sentences and will make them again and again and again, or make five first sentences whenever they can. In any case, every time they make the five first sentences, they will be in the habit of, of um, applying to reparation to the American part of America. Why the reparation? I was saying in the earlier, because our Lord wants his mother to be honored. She has, she has made tremendous efforts in the last 5,100 years to save modern souls, save souls going down hell because of the modern world. She's made tremendous efforts, and broadly speaking, she's been refused. Of course, some, some, some souls have always responded to each of her efforts, but broadly speaking, the modern world continues on this wicked way. She, she has, so to speak, I speak human, so to speak, she has failed. Of course, she hasn't. But that's what it looks, humanly speaking, from the point of view of numbers, or from the point of view of results, that's what it looks like. And so our Lord wants reparation today. He wants people to realize that what uh, she has been doing what uh, and the reaction that has been from men 
that he wants a noble reaction to, to come from men now to make up what's been going on for hundred, uh, hundred years. Ever since, in particular, the French Revolution. The turning point from the old world to the new world, new world was really the French Revolution which descended from Protestantism, of course. So it says, and then it goes on. To encourage Catholics to make these communions a reparation, on December 10th, 1925, Our Lady appeared again to one of the children, and she made the following stupendous offer. She said, quote, Announce in my name, the Mother of God, that I promise to assist at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation, all those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, will go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite five letters of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on some or all of the 50 missions of the Rosary, with the intention of making reparation to me. Imagine how to This promise is a virtual guarantee of salvation. The four conditions, and so the Holy the Confession, can be made eight years before or eight years after the first Saturday, so long as the Holy Communion did proceed in the state of grace. If I'm not in the state of grace, I must go to confession before the first Saturday. If I'm out in the state of grace, I must go to confession after, uh, before or after, the eight years after, to make up the four conditions. Holy Communion is be made on the first Saturday, or it can be made on the Sunday after the Saturday for any just reason approved of by a priest. The same applies to the rosary and the meditation. So if your Saturday is uh, filled, then you can uh, redirect much of it to the Sunday. The normal, the Holy Holy Re the third, the normal five mysteries of the rosary must be recited correctly while one meditates on each of the five mysteries being recited. And then fourth meditation, The 15-minute meditation may be on any or all of the mysteries, but our Lord Lady asks to meditate on each of the 50 mysteries at least once during the five first centuries. On each of the 50, at least once during the five first centuries. Since our Lady spoke of those who keep me company, we should think of her participation in each mystery chosen for <coughs> the meditation. Now there occurs a question, a serious question. How can heaven make it so easy to get to heaven. Just five first sentences. <coughs> action, answer, action. To perform the five first sentences, you will need perseverance to make the five sentences in a row without any interruptions. And you will need to concentrate on performing faithfully each of the four conditions for each of the five sentences. In other words, if heaven makes this offer, the least we've got to do is to perform correctly and properly our side of the bargain. Living with our side of the bargain is, it's got to be, that little has got to be correctly done. Which is why this flag flies me. I'll explain in a moment. Nevertheless, even the, the objection continues. Even this little effort of perseverance is nothing compared with eternal salvation. So how is it possible? How could heaven be making such an offer? Surely the ease of the offer has. Surely the ease of the offer is proportional to the difficulty of today's circumstances. In other words, the more you may be saying as a Catholic how difficult it is today to keep the faith, the more our, our Lord, it was nine first Fridays, it's been shrunk to five first centuries. It was nine first Fridays back in the 17th century and ever since. It's now five first sentence. Heaven seems to prefer odd numbers. And from eternity, God has perfectly known what a godless wasteland his enemies would make out of the modern world with its materialism, its diabolical disorientation, its distracting technology, and its moral and political corruption, which God knew would finish by invading even his church. Of course not. No In such circumstances, he knew also how it would be easier than ever for, all of us to, for any and all of us to fall into heaven. So he offers us, through his merciful mother, eternal salvation, if we will make just one effort for five months, and then, regardless of the world, you will be able to say, let the world do its worst. I have shown God 
I've done at least once in my life, I persevered in love for his mother. And just that much genuine honor for his mother is enough for the divine son. And he'll grant them for that. So that's how and why it was so easy. There's a, there's, a, there's a great tale from the Old Testament, which I always love. The curing of General Naaman. General Naaman was not a Jew. He was a, baby, he was a general of Syria. But he was also a leper. And he was a leper. The leper is a horrible disease. It's something that sort of eats away your limbs, eats away your eyes, it eats away your flesh. Horrible disease until eventually you die. And it's very contagious. So this great general really was with five stars going all over his uniform, his cat. And uh, he was a leper. But he had a Jewish servant somehow. And she said that she told her mistress, she said, Mistress, if only your general would go and see the prophet Elias, Elisha, 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 Elisha. If only we could go see the prophet Elisha in the Holy Land, he could be cured of his legs. So she told her husband, and the husband, oh, what's 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 Still, when he got left, he said, it's worth a try. So he goes to see his king, the king needs permission uh, to, to go to um, the Holy Land and to find the prophet and to see if the general could be cured. So the general gets in his big limousine with, you know, five-star flags on each corner and in his full uniform and he drives to the Holy Land and he starts looking for Elisha and he, uh, he finds Elisha living in a cave in the middle of nowhere so the beautiful limousine has to bump along a rather dusty road, back road, in order to find it arrive in front of the cave. And then when he finds it rising in front of the cave, he says, says try, try. Go to the prophet and tell the prophet, General Naaman is here, and I want to see you. Uh, so the tribe says, uh, yes, General, yes, General. He is not so sure that the prophet will be happy with such a summons. So he goes and sees the prophet, and then something or other happens. Then the, then the driver comes back out again, looking a little sheepish. And the general says, what happened? Uh, general, the prophet said, you need to bathe seven times in the river Jordan and you'll be cured. What? Uh, 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 bathe seven times in the Jordan and you'll be cured. Oh, oh, no, sir, I never heard close for that. General, if the prophet had told you to do something B, would you have done it? Of course I would have done it. Well, he's only asking you to do something quite in the middle. I do need to believe that heaven exists, 
that Our Lady Fatima can obtain for salvation, and that she did make this sensational promise. The judge said she a little humility, just like me. Through the mother, God requires an astonishing little for us to guarantee our eternal salvation, but he does require us to do the little that he requests. And finally, a little effort. All you need for eternal bliss is to be a baptized Catholic and to make the devotion of the five first centuries. The importance of reparation. To honor the Blessed Mother, our Lord insisted on the 20 conditions, four times five, five times four, four conditions for each of five successive months, 20 conditions, being performed with the intention of making reparation for the American Heart of Mary, for the flood of sins being committed today against the American Heart of Mary. In fact, our Lord specified a special intention of reparation for each of the five sacraments. This is something that many people don't know about the five sacraments. The first is reparation for blasphemies committed against various immaculate conception. It's all on the ground, all on the floor. The second uh, Saturday, uh, reparation for blasphemies committed against her perpetual virginity. Third, first Saturday, Reparation of blasphemy is committed against Mary's divine and spiritual mother, maternity. Fourth verse Saturday, reparation for the offences of those who dishonor and reject Mary's images, statues and images. And finally, reparation for those who publicly seek to sow in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred of Mary. This terrible modern education, this terrible modern school teaching what goes on between husband and wife to children of, of, of lower and lower and lower ages, with all details, with all pictures, all complete, complete destruction of their innocence. And they mentioned that also in the 17th century uh, in South America. Uh, 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 Kito, that's what King Wati, Kito, she mentioned it, uh, the destruction of innocence is terrible. Terrible. And there you've got, in this little flyer, you've got 20 little boxes that you can tick. Four for the first Friday, four for the second Friday. The children love ticking little boxes normally. And there are, there are adults that don't mind ticking little boxes. The ticking of little boxes makes sure that you get the 20, you fix, you, you've got a target for the 20, it's clearly, it's clearly laid out there. And as you, at the first, second, second, third, fourth, and fifth, you climb from darkness towards the Mother of God and to light, towards heaven. You climb out of the despair and many horrors of today's modern world towards the promise of guarantee of our Lady and heaven. That is the main solution because our Lord has told us that, to, that this situation turning around depends upon the Pope consecrating Russia to the American Heart of Mary. And the Pope will consecrate Russia. But Benedict XVI was very well aware that that was what the, the mother of fact, our Lady Fatima was wanting from him. But he, Benedict XVI just didn't have enough faith in Fatima, or he didn't have enough faith to realize that, the mother, that, that her method of overcoming the problems of the world's problems would be better than any method that he could invent. And that's again a lack of faith. And you try human means. Human means can't handle the, the situation we're in. It's divine means. What divine means? Exactly this. Our Lord said it's, it's the, the, the consecration of Russia, the Immaculate. And you and I can do something to obtain it. And that is to do exactly what our Lord Lady asked for and what her son asked for. And when there have been enough prayers, from enough Catholics, making reparation to the American period, she will be able to obtain the grace of the consecration from her son to be given to the Pope. And then the Pope will do it. And then the situation turns around. So, my dear friends, the situation is bad. It's much worse than your I can possibly imagine. What's going on in Rabbi Archbishop of Thebes said many years ago, he used to say, you and I, he said, we cannot imagine all the evil that's going on inside the Vatican. He was aware that there's some real mystery of iniquity at work inside, inside the Vatican. 
For many years, uh, there, uh, many, many, well, you may remember that Malik Martin used to say that in 1963 there was a ceremony of enthroning of Satan inside the Vatican. 1963, during the council. And he used to say that uh, there was, the Pope, the Paul, knew about it, couldn't do anything about it. Perfectly possible. These popes, uh, uh, they need a very strong faith to rise up against the smothering by Freemasons, the smothering of the Papacy, the imprisonment of the Pope. The Pope is in prison. You may remember that, that when uh, Pope Rastin was, was elected as Benedict XVI, he asked for prayers that he would stand up to and not be overwhelmed by the wickedness of his enemies. Or he said, what did he say? The wolves, I think he called them wolves, all around. And um, Pope Francis has, has got, is full of wolves. Uh, they're not just outside, it, they're, they're, they're inside. It. They're, they're, and the real problem with Benedict is inside his own head. If these popes had enough faith, they would stand up to these masons. In one way or another. Maybe that was what John Paul I was doing, and he got killed. But if only there was a series of five or six popes who had enough faith, one after the other, to stand up and get martyred, maybe at last enough Catholics would wake up that there's a, a serious, serious problem. And they wouldn't go on with this pussyfooting with these uh, delinquent popes. I'm not suggesting that popes should the Catholics should despise these popes. If they're true popes, they've got to be respected. But they, respecting them does not mean following their nonsense or taking seriously their nonsense. That's what they, that's the example of the Archbishop of Fair Games. So, my dear friends, the problem is terrible, much worse than you or I can think, but there is a simple solution. It's, it's not normal for Almighty God to leave us with a spiritual problem of which he doesn't offer us at the same time the means of getting out of it if we want. We've got to want. And if we want to get out of the problems of today, we can't do much to solve the world's problems. We can do something. We can't do much, but we can certainly do a great deal to make sure that we get to heaven instead of falling to hell. Pray the rosary, especially my dear friends, in the family. And the adults, I'd say, I always say, let the um, families pray the five minutes of rosary, perhaps better in the morning than in the evening, perhaps easier, I say perhaps, I don't know the circumstances of families, perhaps easier in the morning, because it's easy to get the families together then, and it's the beginning of the day that you're giving to God, rather than the back end of the day. Five mystery, family five mystery rosary, and adults, with the help of a finger rosary, it's not all that difficult, Pray 15 mysteries a day. And 15 mysteries are not too many. They're very strong. It's the means of prayer. It's, it's typical of heaven. It's very simple. It's very practical. Like getting in and out of the river. It, it requires nothing except faith and humility. That it does. I've got to humble myself to get in and out of the river. I've got to humble myself to pray this little rosary which the intellectuals despise, and which many modern priests discourage and hate. It's a very simple thing. All the saints, ever since St. Dominic, that, that no other has promoted the rosary, it's a God's answer to Dominic was living exactly at the moment when things began to go wrong, the, the 13th century. That's when, very soon after the 13th century, there was a high point of Christian civilization, Although at that point it seems as though the church was in dead trouble, believe it or not. And the Franciscans and the Dominicans was, were raised by God to defend the church. The, the Dominicans to clear the church's mind, the Franciscans to get rid of simony and to uh, restore polity, the sense of polity, and overcome the problems caused by both. So, my dear friends, pray the rosary, which is God's answer for our problems of today. Thank you.
thank the bishop for his presence here and the grace of receiving the sacrament of confirmation according to the traditional way. You know, the problem of those of my age in their 20s is that, <laughs> that they've been deprived of it, you know. We've been deprived. We didn't know what was the church. Those who are old enough to have seen the church before, they see that what is around us is something different. Something that is not leading souls to heaven. But those of my age don't know. And that has been taken away from them. <coughs> the mass, the sacraments, and the truth. All that has been taken away. By who? By those priests, by those bishops, and even the popes. And they had no right to do so. They had no right to do so. Because Christ came on earth and he gave us the truth. And he gave us the sacraments and he gave us the mass as we celebrate. No one has right to take it away from us. And this is what we do. And this is what the bishop is doing for us. Just giving what he has received from the Archbishop. And the Archbishop did the same, going back to the Apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ. We priests are doing the same. There is no right to deprive you of the truth, of the sacrament, of us. And you have right to those things because Christ gave them to you. That's it. So we have to thank the Bishop for doing that. And in case you have any questions now, you can ask. Yes, Bishop, you said that they didn't blame politicians for people who vote politicians in. They said that they false discipline and say that we're Catholics or priests or bishops who give false obedience to a Pope or sorry to a church that has gone astray and under the for reasons whatever they might say so sometimes they can excuse like this, some reason why they shouldn't think. Surely, if they knowingly are doing that and leading people straight, it is a sin that's the first command. And it's as much of a sin as any of the sin. So if you follow through um, on an action, when you knowingly are following a wrong doctrine or a wrong church, it is as serious a sin against God as any sin. Um, yes, the question is, surely the novice or the priests are guilty of acting against their conscience when they follow the new religion. Is that, that's the question. That's the question I asked of the novice of the priest uh, just yesterday. Um, and he said, and he knows speaking from inside, it was inside the novice, he said, it's a generational thing. Um, the priests of the Vatican II generation um, are not they, they convince themselves that the, the new religion is right. They convince themselves. And of course they convince many other souls as well. Um, there is what's known in modern theology as a guilt at the beginning. Uh, I'll give you a simple, com uh, a simple comparison. Um, when a pilot flies a little plane, a little plane in mountainous country, flies a little plane into a cloud, he's very stupid to um, offense. It's a great offense if he's getting passions to fly into the cloud. But once he's in the cloud, he's blind. So, um, the, a lot of these priests that will be, God knows, will be guilty of having got into it in the first place. God knows the measures, knows exactly the guilt. And you can say also that if they are priests of the Catholic Church, then it's not only when they fly into the cloud, but even inside the cloud, all of them will have a guardian angel on their shoulder, quietly trying to tell them that they're flying wrong, that it's a stupid thing to do, and they've got to, you know, backtrack in some way, which I've said before. Now, as the exact guilt of these priests is maybe difficult to tell. God knows. You may, there's a strong argument to be made that all of them have some knowledge of, of the fact that they're on the long term. 
and uh, there are all the time, uh, there, is, there is all the time a trick of these priests who, who listen to this guardian angel that's on their shoulder that can see, for instance, through Fatima, because Fatima is right through the novice order, it's known about the novice order. So Fatima is one opportunity for these priests to realize that there's something wrong. Um, this priest told me yesterday that all of them know that, or all of the young priests know that something is wrong. But since, as Father just said, Father Bellini just said, since they never had a proper formation, they don't know what's wrong. Just like the rock sinners, they, they, they're very eloquent about the rottenness of materials. I, I, I always think of, um, what's it, Roger, um, we don't need no education. <laughs> Roger. Walters. Walters. Walters, that's thanks. Yeah. Um, the, the wall, that's it. The wall. Uh, it's a very, he takes, he takes about parents, he takes about the schools, he takes about church. He, he, he goes all around, and by the twelfth song, he's reckoning a goodbye, uh, was it goodbye, horrible world, was it that song? Goodbye. Cruel, cruel world. Cruel world. Uh, cruel world, thank you. Uh, goodbye, cruel world. And the number of dancers have committed suicide because of it. And uh, in other words, he's got, he's got a real grasp of the problem. He's not got any real situation. So the young, young priests know that there's something wrong, they don't know what it is. Now I'll bet you that many of them have some... God is all the time dropping a very light thread on their shoulder. And they are, they, what's that? Ah, they throw it away, or what's that? Ah, that's pretty. Pull it in, in comes a little chain. Ah, that's, that's, that's it. Pull in the little chain, in comes in the little, it's a thick of rope. So, tell the right to the truth. So, God is all the time giving His grace to all souls. Otherwise, there's no purpose of leaving them on the face of the earth. They might just go die. Which is one reason why a number of sinners do die. Because if they're going to go on living, they want to let go on sinning, they're going to go on keeping in hell. All, all this is God's mystery. In any case, it's a long way to answer to it. It's a, it's a complicated question. I've often myself found. Have, I found compassion, for, I feel compassion for the novice order priests, but by golly, some of them are real to the ones. Some of them know that they're destroying the God's church, especially inside the Vatican. They know that they're deliberately destroying the God's church. They, they've got a tremendous responsibility at the heart of the church. But there are, there are priests who don't know it. I'd say that, that, that really don't know and are a good one. Now, is that an answer question? Okay. I'm right. Our obedience has to be priest on the same way. And the time straight into that culture. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't... Uh, the SSPX is, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, the SSPX is sinking, it's not yet sunk. Uh, there are a number of good priests who see what's going on, who want to react, and can see no way for the moment of reacting. They're waiting. Bishop McGallery is, uh, is, is very intelligent, and he advises people to wait. He said, wait until 2018, when he hopes the society will get rid of Bishop Fully and Sukhya and Jeremy. In the meantime, Bishop Fully has filled the, elect, the body of electors, there are 40, High 40 priests occupying important positions in the society. Each of those, when each of those positions comes vacant, he puts in a little, he often puts in a little Swiss, a little compatriot of his, who he can rely on to vote for him when it comes to 2018. He's undoubtedly hoping to have the system tied up. Whether he, whether he will have it tied up or not depends upon these priests. He may put a little Swiss in, and then the little Swiss opens his eyes, and when the moment comes, doesn't vote for Bishop Fully. I don't know. I, I have no idea what's going to happen. But uh, I'm afraid that the, in general, one may well fear that the mass of SSPH priests have caught exactly the same disease as the mass of, uh, of uh, mainstream priests before Vatican II. 
But at Vatican II, there was a handful in each country. There were one or two or three or four or five priests who never let go of the true mass, kept hold of the true religion, and acted as a hyphen, a, junk, a, a joiner, between the good church before the council and the SCPS after the council. And they, they acted as a, as a like Father Ickney in Switzerland, Father Diamond in French Canada, and there are others, of course. Uh, so uh, there are there will be a few priests that stand out, and a few priests have stood out. But as, as, as this uh, text suggested, the priests, these priests don't have an easy time. It's not easy to organize. It's not easy to uh, pull them together, to unite them. It's not easy for them to submit one another, I don't know. Uh, so it looks disorganized, it looks there are they have reacted. They have at least reacted. And some of them for exactly the right reasons. They couldn't stand the falsity being, being poured down throughout the society from the top. The poison being poured down. They couldn't stand it. The false, the lies. Can't stand the lies. It's a very healthy reaction. And to drive some of them out of the society already. Others are waiting inside. I'm sure that when, the, when it comes to when it comes to down to crunch, uh, there are more priests in the society who will react well. But if things keep sliding the way they are today, they won't be many. So many of the estimated priests do know, but many of them are preferring not to know. And they're sliding. It goes from case to case. Case by case, in the individual case. So they see that cloud from a distance. I'm sure, yes, I feel like imagine. I'm sure that some of these priests, or perhaps many of them, see the danger of sliding, but they want to believe that they're not going to be caught themselves. They're not going to get caught themselves. But there's a real danger of getting caught without their realizing. Because it's you, you, you slide unconsciously. Many, many of the laity notice that their SSPX priests are not the men they were three, five years ago. They notice that. They're more inclined to compromise, they take less clear positions, they're no longer as clear as they used to be, because they've gone along with the movement of the society as a whole, which is absolutely down. So I don't know where exactly they are in, in terms of the comparison. They're sort of being persuaded to follow the leader into the cloud. They're making the decision little by little to go into the cloud. But the trouble is that um, human weakness is on the side of going along with the ghetto. And not on the side of standing up and having to start again with a new congregation. I met just recently a young priest who, who stood up and got out of the society, definitely for the right reasons. But he's not, he's not finding it easy. He's not finding it too easy. I won't say who he is or where he is, but a good young priest. It's not, you know, it's not the easy way to get out. The easy way is to stay where you are and go with the crowd, go with the flow. But the flow of the Bishop Fellier and the gang is not good. Not good. They are betraying the Archbishop, make no mistake. Yes. Question, please, Lord. Uh, just on the theme that we're on at the moment, and you talk about, which is, I think it's an important theme, and it's come up, and it's my question similar. You analogise with the, which I think is excellent about a plane and going into the clouds yeah. with the priesthood, the priesthood that we've got. For, for myself, I feel that a lot of this is to do with Marxism and that from very early on there's been an, uh, an infiltration, a corruption, um, that Marxism has come into the faith and that Marxism exists all around us. I'm from Liverpool, I see it. 
I, I'm, I'm wondering, okay, I understand about prayer, uh, your Lordship. Is there any other antidote, though, in a practical sense, as well as prayer, that we can use? Is there any other remedy than prayer? I say the next thing of prayer is to read, because Catholics can't act until they've got the right idea. They're not going to action is not going to be right until the idea is right. The idea is not going to be right if if you don't put good ideas into your head. And the best way to do that today is to read. So get hold of good literature. Um, there's a lot of good literature on the back there, uh, from coming from the Fatima Center, which is powerful here in Ireland. Um, and you can sign up with the Fatima Center here in Ireland for their publications, maybe to join them in action. But if, before you can act, well, you've got to know care and government. You've got to understand. To understand well, today you've got to be. The propaganda coming from the bad guys, from the vile media, is relentless. Media are terrible. They're in the hands of the people who are behind Marxism. If they aren't themselves Marxists, again, I would dare mention the name because, etc., um, uh, etc. Et uh, it's the same people. Um, they are bitter and deep enemies of the faith, enemies of the church, enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they 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 have money. They buy the media. They went television. They didn't invent television, but the moment it was invented, they bought it up. They're now buying up and controlling the internet because they got to control the internet because the internet has been is, is making available a lot of truth. There's a lot of mark on the internet. There's a lot of lies on the internet, but there's also a lot of truth. If you know what you're looking for, you where to look for it. And one link, of course, can go to the next and so on and so on. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, go to the internet, although you can find a lot of things there. And it's surprising how, or well, it's not surprising actually, it's, it's noteworthy how a number of souls make their way to tradition from a starting point on the internet. They, they've got some, they saw something there, and God used this baby, the internet, maybe you may call the internet an instrument of the devil, but God uses it for sure. And there are souls, especially young souls, that have no idea and then tumble across, stumble across something on the other. And from one thing to another, they make their way to tradition. That's happened quite often. Uh, therefore, the internet you can find the truth. If you know what it's written, you know what you're looking for. But the problem with the internet is you oh, often need to, to know what's right before you come to the internet. The internet is a chaos. It's, it's everything there. It's a great wondering, huge muddle. But, uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can find the golden nuggets in the market. For instance, on the, on the six million Jews supposedly gassed in the Second World War, on that subject, known as the Holocaust, look, you, you've got all kinds of material telling, telling the, the historical reality of that event, or the historical unreality. It's an emotional reality. It's, it's a typical example of people thinking with their emotions. And that's very common to me. Oh, I feel you. Do you remember? Um, I, I feel you. Oh. Do you remember <coughs> President Clinton? Who oh, was unspeakable for? <laughs> but but the, when the Oklahoma building got, that's we're talking about 1995. That's too too far back. Not a number of you. But when the Mur Alfred Murrah building in Oklahoma was um, supposedly. Um, Destroyed. What was, it? what was the story? It was destroyed by terror. No, it was destroyed by the right wing. It was a stunt, a government stunt, in order to discredit the militia, which were getting, the right wing militia, which were getting too strong, and to recredit the wretched government of Bill uh, Clinton. So he arrived soon after the event. Actually, it was, a, it was an inside job. Mm. And that's easy to prove, like many of these things, especially. Especially 9 11. You look at it carefully, it's easy to prove their sons. The latest, maybe in Nice. In Nice, some of the lobbies on the, on the paper were Taylor's manicures. 
uh, uh, the, 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 you know, to tell the suit, you've got these, these sort of plastic men. You see the shop in the sometimes without any clothing on, just plastic. But when well, some of those were dressed in human clothes, and they spilled some red ink just by side, and that was a corpse. Well, it was, you look, look carefully at it, it isn't a corpse at all. So, so Nice is absolutely not what it was made up of. The, the modern governments are pulling these stunts one after another. And the very first reports often let loose a detail which is shut up immediately because it, the detail observed by somebody or reported by some reporter begins to point in the direction of the truth that is a stunt. Therefore, therefore the, the best reports, whenever it is one of these stunts happens, the best reports to listen to the very first reports. After that, the vision of cover up immediately starts. But the stunt, the populations today are so stupid that usually these stunts work. 9 11 was a classic, classic piece. It was an absolute stunt. But it had, it had a desired effect. It promoted the one world government, it promoted the police state, it made possible the war on Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and it's all a force, a big force. And Syria. Uh, and Syria. Syria. Yes. Uh, the, the lies told by these media are horrible. I was never going to that. What was the question? <laughs> Where were they? Marxist. Marxist, yes. Um, well, Marxism is a sheer creation of those people. Communism equals Judaism. Judaism equals communism. That's for sure and so. Look at the origins of communism. Look at the number of those people who were, uh, they, they took over Russia. And they took revenge on Russia, because for a long time Russia had treated them badly, or what we would think about it, this was just, and this was entirely just. Well, she, one looks badly, and they took their revenge. So, and, and ma communism and modernism are closely linked. They're both godless. Modernism is godless, it's putting man in the place of God. Communism is intrinsically godless. It's atheistic materialism. And it's true that the mass of the modern population, the modern Western populations, are atheistic materialists. People today, the mass of Westerners today, don't take Almighty God seriously. He's a toy. He's a nice little dog to be put along on a leash. He'll do what I tell him. And uh, when I want to get out, I, I leave him behind. And then I take him up, and, and he's a sweet little thing. And I love patting him on the neck and making him go, 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 go. He's a toy. Almighty God is a toy. That's how he's treated by a mass of people today. And uh, the people are ineffective atheists. They don't take God seriously. The mass of people don't, they don't take God seriously. And they're, they're atheistic. And they also love materialism and the things of man and money. And since they love money and they don't love God, then they fall easy prey to these people who give them a substitute religion. And that substitute religion is often uh, what is modernism and also Holocaust the end. Because the Holocaust is a substitute religion. You've got Auschwitz to replace Golgotha, you've got the gas chambers to replace the cross, and you've got the Jewish people, the six million, to replace the redeemer. And you've got the birth of Israel to replace the resurrection. It's a complete religion. So, all of these things are, if you go back to the root of all of these attacks, of these serious attacks upon Christianity, you will often find the same thing that you find. That's why you will find um, atheistic materials in perfect sync with modernism. Because the mass of modern people are atheists and therefore they're materialists. They turn away from God firstly, and then they turn towards the goodies of matter, of materialism. But the good turning towards the goods of materialism only follows from turning away from God. Uh, Your Lordship, my question has to do with uh, Vladimir Putin. And our lady told us that if the world didn't change the ways that many nations would be united, I'm looking at, in particular, communism. And we saw the fall of Berlin Wall, etc. And we were told that communism was dead. 
we see Vladimir Putin presented to us as a devout uh, 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 Russian Orthodox Christian who is probably one of the most outstanding politicians at the moment in the globe in terms of what we could call it decency, human decency. And yet I'm figuring is communism dead? Because if I remember reading two books belonged to Anatoly Govitsyn, one was uh, New Nights for Old and the other one was, was The Perestroika Deception. So my question is really, is, is communism dead under Putin? Or what exactly is going on in Russia? And connected to it, is there a, is there a religious revival in Russia happening? Okay. Um, is there a religious revival going on in Russia? And is Putin the good man he seems to be? Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, is there a religious revival? Yes, I think there is. I can remember a f friend, Father Black, was in Russia, and she observed a huge queue. This may be 15 years ago. A huge queue. I think it was in St. Petersburg, outside a church of Russians patiently waiting to go inside the church to be able to venerate an icon. And they had to wait for hours and hours, they were just patiently waiting for them. Father Black got in rather early because he was in, I think he was in religious dress, uh, but otherwise he had to wait for hours. Another friend was in Russia and noticed that the Russian on the street, who was the average Russian, there's still some something there which there is no longer in the West. The Westerners are blasted. The Westerners are a wasteland, spiritually speaking. The masked Westerners are just a wasteland. Nothing spiritual at all. Pure materialists. Weekend, holidays, and so on. Um, therefore, they, 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 and the reason why, one serious reason, why there is a real religious revival going in Russia, they've rebuilt a huge number of churches. they rebuilt monumental churches in St. Petersburg and Moscow, as far as I know. Stalin deliberately destroyed one. It's been rebuilt, just completely rebuilt. A famous church in Moscow, I forget the name. Anyway, uh, it is a real religious revival. It's not Catholic. It's Orthodox. But the, there is something genuine in Orthodox. Something genuine. It's not Catholic. So if I was to pretend that it is as good as Catholicism, I would be skinned alive, quite right. So I don't pretend it's as good as Catholicism. But it's as good, it's, it's, it may be better than not the novel sort of Catholicism. You see what I mean? I mean, the best is the true Catholicism, then may come some features of Catholicism, then come some down features of the, of the novel sort. So there is the, the icons, let's take the icons. There's a real religious feeling in the icons of the, of the of Orthodox, which I, do, I myself don't find in the post-Renaissance religious art of the West, which is all more or less, was it uh, Caravaggio, Botticelli, I don't know. It's, ever since the Renaissance, the, the art, the religious art of the West has been Baroque art. Well, it's, it's the, there is beauty in it. It's not deep. The Baroque is not deep. It's beautiful, but it's not all that deep. There's, there, there's, there's no religious, in some parts, of, in certain, some of the music of orthodoxy, in some of the art of orthodoxy, there's a real religious sense. So there is something in orthodoxy. And the, the Russians are coming back to it. Um, the proof is that all of these churches they've been built, and on, on the street in St. Petersburg, my friend observed that, um, that there, there's there's a depth, a genuineness in there which there isn't in the West Coast. Why? Because of 70 years of communism. The Russians are a religious people. They're convinced they have a, 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 a mission. They call themselves, the Moscow calls themselves the Third Rome. There was Rome, then there was Constantinople, and now there's Russia. The Russians have a religious ambition. The reason why they took the communism so much was because communism was a substitute religion. Created by the people who once had, or for 2,000 years had, the real religion. And that's what gave those people a sense of how to put together a false religion. And they've been putting it together ever since in order to pull away people from Christ. And communism was designed to destroy Christianity.
Christianity. <coughs> we didn't succeed. And if the reason for the religious revival is the reaction against all that suffering. The Greek word, Isidro, says, in suffering is learned. But when you, if you think back on your life, you'll probably find that the moments when you really learn something is the moments when you were suffering. That's when reality struck home, when you were suffering. But you didn't want to suffer, you had to. Reality was established, re established, re -established. So the, all of the suffering of the communism has now helped to generate this religious reaction, which Our Lady will take hold of when the concentration is made, or when the point of both concentration is Russia. Russia will, and they won't convert to Vatican Catholicism. No way does it. They will not convert to that bogus Catholicism. They will convert to the real article, and that's what they will do. And it will be what uh, explained in the expression of John Paul II. He said, Christianity breathing with both its lungs, the Eastern one and the Western one. Now that's a bad way of putting it because it, it suggests that they're on a par, they're, they're equal, they're not equal. Orthodoxy has disqualified itself for 800 years. But uh, there is something there, and that something will come back, will come roaring back. It's coming back, it will come roaring back as soon as Our Lady attends the consecration of Russia. So I think the answer is it, there is a genuine. And Putin is doing all he can to promote it, as best I know. I don't pretend to be an expert, I can give you my opinion. I read uh, recently, or just a few days ago, on the internet, an article. Arguing that Putin is genuine <coughs> by the very common sense argument, look at his fruits, look at what he's done, look at what he's actually done. Uh, the vile West is, is provoking and provoking and provoking because the vile West wants war. Putin does not want war. Putin wants peace. If they go on and on and on provoking him, at some point he may well attack. And when he attacks, The vile media, it's easy to see, are going to scream, he's the aggressor, he's the aggressor, he's the aggressor. When they've been poking him and they are provoking him, for instance, with the crashing of the Malaysian airliner on, over the Ukraine, which the Ukrainians did, a couple of Ukrainian fighters shot down that airliner. Our vile media told us to the end in part. And then the, uh, another example, the Turks who shot down the Russian fighter bomber, Uh, if it was over or very near the frontier of Turkey, between Turkey and Russia. And Putin could have gone to war over that. It was a provocation. Uh, apparently, since the delinquent Prime Minister or, or President of Turkey, Erdogan, has apologized to Putin, we didn't, we don't read about this apology. So they, they, how can you and I know what's going on when our media are absolutely against Putin? Uh, pretending that he's a tame tyrant, uh, pretending this, that, the other, to have an excuse finally to attack him or to provoke him to attack so that they can get then in the third world war, which the same delinquents are uh, hoping and trusting will give them final, complete control of the new world order. Final, complete control of the world for and with their godless new world order. That's their dream. It's not likely to come off. I don't think yet, because we're not yet in the end of the world. I don't think we're yet uh, at the um, time of the Antichrist, nor... Uh, I think what, what I, I think, it's just a bit, that we're going through the dress rehearsal of the Antichrist. And um, I think Putin may well finally be provoked to attack. The Russians have some very fine weapons, which the, the West is not necessarily capable of encountering. The West also has weapons. But something that the West has is a lot of corrupt young men. Are these corrupt young men with drugs and everything else going to be able to find his soldiers? It's a question. There has to be a question. <coughs> in any case, which way it will go, in the Psalms, in the Psalms it says, don't count on your horses and your arrows, or your bows and arrows, because of your weapons at that time. It's not a question of war, it's not a question of weapons. War is a question of almighty war. So, you know, it's, which way the war will go is in God's hands. Personally, I think he will punish the vile West with a presently vile West with a triumphal Russia. <coughs> Then, when Father Kramer has a lot of ideas about, from prophecy, about how the, once the Russians have conquered Europe, then the Chinese will attack Russia. Yes. 
And then the consecration, that's when the consecration will be done. And then the Russia will come for the Chinese. So, then Russia and then the converted Russia and with, with the, uh, the Catholic countries will rediscover their faith under the oppression of the New World Order. So the resurgent Catholic countries and converted Russia will join forces and they will defeat the enemy, which is not communism, but the perpetual ancient enemy, which is paganism. Yeah, that's another story. Is that an answer question? I think it is a change. I think it's a gift of God. I think some people must be dreaming about to assassinate. Some people say that the Malaysian airline was passing very about very close to the same time as Putin's Russian Air Force number one. And they shot at the wrong place. That's one possibility. Who knows? We don't know because of the number of the because these horrible modern governments lie and lie and lie because they're against Christ. They can't afford to afford the truth. If they afford the truth and show what they're really are about, what they're really about. And but it's, it's we who deserve these governments. God gives us the governments we deserve. Or often better than we deserve because of us as But it's, it's, the, it's we the people's fault. Any other I have a question. <laughs> when you said about how the church is decreasing and being defeated, it's going to, as it will disappear. And I recall when Cardinal Lani said this in 1861, he said it was not his own personal opinion, but he gets this from the unanimous teaching of the ancient fathers. And we, we see something becoming more universal, something more visible to consider your church, which is always moving toward apostasy and into paganism. Does Bishop Pillay understand? But by endorsing authors who stigmatize this, this, uh, this theological opinion, which is in scripture, it's taught by the fathers, by the greatest theologians in the history of the church, that the church will be, as it were, to use Cardinal Manning's words, swept off the face of the earth. It will appear to have disappeared. We have this monstrosity which is moving towards paganism into full apostasy to consider your church. And Bishop Pillay is promoting this idea that this visible monstrosity, uh, since the church has to remain completely visible, as if this monstrosity, this counterfeit church, would have to be acknowledged as being the Catholic Church. As if the conciliar church, no matter how far it strays from the faith, would have to be considered Catholic. Does Bishop Pillay understand that the consequences of his words? I don't think so. I don't think so. I can't speak of what he thinks, but I, you know, again, obviously everyone, everyone was reads and other things he says and writes. But uh, I think he's, um, he's locked into the dream. He's born into the dream. And I think he, he's just like John the Prince, the way of the prophets of doom. He doesn't want to know about the end of the world. He doesn't want to hear about the Antichrist. He doesn't believe all of that, uh, what do you say, gloom and doom. He, he's a, a gloom and doom rejecter. The world is fine, it's getting finer. The, the Catholic, the city church is the Catholic church. We're going to join that church. We're going to help them to convert the world. We're on the march towards... Uh, Making Jesus Christ the king, the king of the world. He's a, he's into a dream. He's he's a fantasist. I, I think he just doesn't see things. Simply doesn't see. How would he not see? Because he's been slowly and skillfully blinded by we know who. The devil. Uh, when when did he begin? He wasn't always like this. Um, I'd say a great moment forward on this back path was in 2000. When he, um, when three of the four SSBF bishops had lunch with Cardinal Caspian and Oil, and we may have the story of six different kinds of nuts, or six or twelve different kinds of nuts, uh, nibbles before a, a six-course meal, and 
then at the end of the meal, here's a, here's a rose pick from the Holy Father. Hug, 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 embrace, embrace, embrace. My door is always open to you. I love you. You must love me. Uh, this is the cardinal uh, the, 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 on the occasion of the society having just made its jubilee pilgrimage uh, for the Holy Year of 2000. And I think from that moment onwards, I think the red buttons and the uh, scarlet, the scarlet buttons and the scarlet packs and the marble walls, I think all of that got under Bishop of his skin. He was glamorized and magnetized by the glory of Rome, the appearance of the glory of Rome, and has failed to see what's really going on inside. It's a great, in my opinion, it's a great blindness. He does. So he's become a Roncalio. Uh, yes, I think so. He's gone, he's been, I think he's been seduced by whatever, what, by that which seduced from the yes. Yeah. And it's, it's in the whole modern world, it's all around us, the glory of the fantasy. Man is the grace of God, and it's, it's, it's a brave new world we have been introduced to. And everything's going to be better and lovelier and finer than ever. I think that's it. Oh boy, well, in fact, this is true, he's going to find out the heart of it. Anwar, the last question for me. Yeah. How could Bishop Fellow be blind when you learned, I learned in the cemetery, with the, the principle that the, the, the superior, the inferior does not form the superior? Right. He knows that. Right. He thinks he, he may think that he's going to go in with Rome and change Rome. He, he received the same, the same training as well, too. Like he lost it, and he must have received as well, too. He has a selective memory. Like anybody who's going the wrong way, they remember the things they want to remember, they forget the things they want to forget in order to blind themselves to be able to go on with their false path. So he, he knew initially that he was going the wrong way? He, he, he surely knew, yes, because there was a time when his public speeches were all against the false conciliation. We're going back now 20 years. Already 20 years ago, he was the Superior General. So, my dear friends, pray and read. You've got a stack of good books there, and the Fatima Center to sign up for if you want to act. God bless you all. Let me give you a lesson.